When a woman falls in love, it can bring out the best the shooter! and oh, the lady, worst. Lady, don't shoot. Oh, God, don't oh. A besotted teenager turns on her best friends. You don't bring guns to a marshmallow roast. I'm leaving. A mother chooses her boyfriend over her only child. I can't imagine what she would be thinking. And frankly, I don't want to. I don't want to think like Penny Boudreau. And a nurse becomes a killer on the run. She didn't regret anything. She did it for the love of her life. These deadly women live with blood on their hands thanks to love gone wrong. Christine Paolilla is a tortured soul. She would be instantly terrified. She would see her face in the mirror haunted by the faces of her four murdered friends. It was tragic and it was awful, and it was something no matter what they were doing, they certainly did not deserve. Christine Paolilla has always been a loner teased as a child because of an embarrassing disease. Alopecia, or hair loss, is almost always caused by severe stress. I mean, the fact that Christine lost her hair at such a young age is so, so sad, but it speaks to the enormous stress she was under. This poor little girl lost her daddy. She's only a couple years old. And then her mother turned to drugs, and that made it even worse. Against the odds by the age of 17, Christine is no longer the ugly duckling. The kids in the Clear Lake High School were a very supportive bunch. And that is where Christine finally found acceptance. <laughs> Life is on the up when she meets her first boyfriend, Chris Snyder. Christine's attraction to Chris is really no surprise. Chris was an outsider. Christine felt like an outsider all her life. So it was really a perfect match. Christine also has her first real girlfriends. Popular senior students, Rachel Colarutis and Tiffany Rowell. They knew Christine had been picked on and made fun of, and they kind of took her under their wing and, and made her feel accepted. Christine is now part of the in crowd, the party set. Tiffany was living in a home in her senior year in high school without any parent. She had a boyfriend who was very involved in ecstasy and marijuana, and there's a strong suspicion of a lot of drug dealing activity going on in the house. Drugs are also part of Christine's life, nice guys. as well as petty crime and violent movies, thanks to Chris. Have you ever thought about what it'd be like to actually kill someone? Chris was a very dark person. I think I'd be the biggest rush in the whole world. 
taking pretty much a path of destruction and not caring who he took with him. He seemed to be very much a sociopath. What would you say if I could get you a gun? He definitely was not the kind of influence that Christine needed if she was going to recover from her difficult past. Is that something you might be interested in? Yeah. Yeah? Mm -hmm. I think Christine was a ticking time bomb, and Chris Snyder lit the fuse. The lovers know drugs and cash are abundant at Tiffany's home. Is that it? They want them at any price. Rachel Colarudis is wearing her tennis shoes and is fully dressed. She's getting ready to go to the mall. She allows them in and they make their way into the living room. What's up, bro? Yo, any folks? Without warning, their friends become their enemies. Yo, oh, 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 oh. I'm gonna ask you again, where are the pills? Is this a joke? It was clear the way things quickly developed that they were willing to do whatever it took to get what they want. While Snyder is holding the others on gunpoint, Christine Paolella takes Rachel through the house to look for the drugs and the money. Come on! Put them in there. Put the gun down. Shut up! But robbery is not enough. She absolutely laid out why she had to kill him. She said, don't rob your friends. You couldn't rob your friends because they would be able to identify you. Rachel gets shot numerous times. Through her legs and to her buttocks and back area. And that Christine and Christopher then leave. Let's just go. Go! <laughs> Rachel is still alive. <laughs> Critically wounded, she makes a desperate attempt to get help. I can only imagine that there was just sheer fear and terror despite being shot all those times, uh, she still was able to fight and still was trying to get help for herself. Her nightmare is far from over. I feel so much heart-rending pain for Rachel. Her final moments on this earth were nothing but horror. summer of 2003, in Clear Lake, Houston, four young friends are shot in cold blood. Three years later, killer Christine Paulilla is still free, or is she? is wearing her down. She really believed that Rachel was haunting her, and that Rachel was warning her, saying that you're going to end up paying for what you did to me. 
drugs that turned her into a killing machine now consume her life. She's paranoid and hasn't stepped out of her filthy motel room for nine months. There was a line of, of syringes, like little soldiers on the dresser, all filled with heroin, ready to fire away. Christine's only companion is her new husband, Justin Rott, a fellow drug addict. She says, I trust you, and I need to talk. I had to go back inside to make sure that they were all dead. She went back in by herself, she told me, and Rachel was still alive. She had no more bullets. No! No! And Christine pistol whipped her. Until she died. <sighs> there was blood everywhere. She got back in the car, and Chris took her to work. 30 minutes after this happened. He went to work. And I think that's what really got me the most. <laughs> that act tells me everything I need to know about the heart and soul of Christine. It's black. Chuck me. Need to figure out what I'm gonna do, what we're gonna do, what's the truth, what's really going on here, because uh, it shocked me. Christine's loose lips will eventually be her downfall. Someone came forward with a tip that pointed them in the direction of Christine and Chris. Get on the ground! Get on the ground! Get on the ground! Don't move! Don't your hands your hands with my Police are led to Christine and Justin's putrid motel room. Hands behind your back! Come on, hands behind your back! It was worse than some of the uh, decomposed body scenes I've been on. The place just absolutely reeked along with blood being spattered on the walls from using the needles. Under police questioning, Justin crumbles. Not until the day we actually got arrested did it actually become real and like she did do this. Everything she's told me is true. This isn't a, a joke, this isn't fake, this isn't, this is real. Christine is convicted of four counts of murder. An automatic life sentence. The other killer, Chris Snyder, will never be brought to justice. By the time they got there, Chris was dead. He'd gone into the woods and taken his own life. Some people say, oh, that shows Chris's remorse. I don't think so. That's the hallmark of a sociopath. Christine killed the only two girlfriends she ever had, and she did it without anger. Christine could probably kill anyone. She's a very dangerous woman.
When love goes wrong, there's always casualties. I can't imagine what was going through Penny Boudreaux's mind in those moments on that dark road. I had a daughter roughly the same age. It hit home. It was, it, it was awful. One cold night in Nova Scotia will forever chill the bone. I can't imagine what she would be thinking. And frankly, I don't want to. I, I don't want to think like Penny Boudreaux. I'm just here to reach out to my daughter, Carissa. It's the saddest moment imaginable. You home. A mother begging a nation to find her child. Please just reach out to someone. Please call us. People saw okay. this woman who was being traumatized by the fact that her child was missing, um, and they wanted to help. 12-year-old Carissa Boudreaux has been missing for two days in terrible, cold weather. If there's anyone out there who's seen her, please call. Her mother, Penny, is desperate. She was very tearful. She spoke of wanting her daughter to come home. We all love you. But it is all a lie. Journalist Lisa Brown was at that press conference. The winter of 2008, in Bridgewater, Canada. Penny appeared to be a very upset, distraught mother who was concerned about her child. That's certainly what the community as a whole saw. What the community doesn't see is an angry mother constantly at odds with her daughter. We are not going home. Just let me out of the car. I'll walk home. You are not getting out of the car. You're ruining my life. Oh, I'm ruining your life. Penny's parenting is going badly. You are making me crazy. You are pushing me. Oh, my God. Just let me out of the car. When her 12-year-old daughter would be upset, screaming and yelling, as 12-year-old girls are prone to do. Penny got right there with her. Mom, I want to go home! You keep pushing me, I tell you! Acting like another 12-year-old, screaming and yelling. Stop screaming at me! Go, you just idiot. keep pushing me! I hate you, I hate you, I hate you! And on this me. cold stop night, the, the arguments stop. will stop. stop she finally drove to, uh, a rural road right outside town. You're crazy, Mom! You're me out and told Carissa that if she wanted to get out, now was her chance. I'm telling everybody at school what a bitch you are! Carissa got out of the car and Penny tackled her. You're <laughs> Penny took the twine from her pocket. She wrapped it around Carissa's neck. <laughs> it's going to take approximately two to three minutes to kill someone with a ligature. The fact that her mother was kneeling on Carissa's chest meant that it was more difficult for Carissa to breathe. She would have attempted to gasp for air. At the same time, looking into the eyes of her mother. Penny reports her daughter missing. The initial indication was, OK, this is an upset child. She may have run off, and she may be hiding with a friend. It starts as a routine case for Bridgewater police officer John Collier. Usually with our efforts, 
we are able to locate the young person within 48 to 72 hours. Your friend Sarah is worried sick. This didn't happen. Please just reach out to someone. The press okay. conference yields few leads. If there's anyone out there who's seen her, please call. How could it? The fact that Penny went in front of a camera and made pleas to the public as the broken-hearted mother... I just want to tell you, lots of people who love you... ...speaks to her evil nature. Two weeks later, Carissa's body is found. Where and how her mother left her. Carissa was found with her jeans pulled partway down, one leg on, one leg off. Her underwear were down. She didn't think the body would be found for quite some time, and she believed that people would think that Carissa had been sexually assaulted, and that would aid her case. Bridgewater is in mourning and in panic at the thought of a sexual predator on the loose. This is a community that had not experienced any kind of crime like this or a disappearance like this. There was that, who did this? Are they, are they living amongst us? And uh, is it going to happen again? In January 2008, the Canadian town of Bridgewater, Nova Scotia, is shocked by the brutal murder of a young girl. There were numerous concerns within the community that uh, there was possibly uh, someone who was out there sexually assaulting children. But the truth is far more disturbing. The victim, Carissa Boudreau, was like any other 12-year-old. And so is her mother. What the hell have you been saying about me at school? You better not have broken my stereo! Answer the question! I don't Penny's extreme immaturity is highlighted by the fact that when her you daughter would be upset me, and maybe mother. screaming Why and yelling, I hate you! Well, I hate you! Penny, rather than acting like the adult, would start screaming and yelling yes, also. Right. You gotta tell me what you said! The period! Oh, get out of my room! Her boyfriend, Vernon McCumber, is tired of the constant arguing. <laughs> well, that was real oh. constructive, wasn't it? Don't you start. I'm supposed to stay here, put up with all this crap? Well, I had enough. I'm leaving. Brennan, don't say that. I'm serious. Either she goes, or I go. He did not mean it by the way of, ultimately, you should murder her, but he meant that she either has to go back to her father or the relationship is over. Penny doesn't take any chances. To keep her lover, she murders her flesh and blood. How could you do that? I did this for How could you? It's a shocking choice that no one can imagine. Can you talk to me? Until you there is a surprising breakthrough. The neighbors of theirs actually overheard uh, Penny Boudreau and Vernon McCumber arguing in their apartment. Mr. McCumber, of course, making certain statements to the fact of, Pen, Pen, why did you do this? I did it for us. You said her or me. That's not what I meant, you crazy bitch. 
We were looking at potentially the mother and Vernon McCumber being involved in, in, in Carissa's death. Both are arrested on suspicion of murder. Although Vernon believes Penny is the murderer, he says nothing. Without a confession, police pin their hopes on an elaborate sting. I'm a good friend of the he trusts me. Don't you worry about that. They had put the undercover operator in first with the boyfriend. No drops until he meets you, though, OK? Yeah, of Became confident of him. I'm definitely interested. Indicated to him that he was part of a cross-country crime organization originating out of Montreal that they could possibly use his help in around this area. So that, that's it. That's it. Once that released, now. the couple is eager to that make some shot. easy money. Understood. They very quickly felt that he had nothing to do with it and then uh, switched the investigation to centering on Penny Boudreau. Penny confides to the fictitious crime syndicate. Every couple of months they come back and they tell me they found something new. Her fear that the police are on her trail. You know, I just wish that police vault would blow up or burn down. Well, if you get picked for this job, maybe something can be arranged. The undercover cop offers her a deal. If she kills for them, they will get rid of the police evidence. I can do this. <laughs> How do I know you're not going to chicken out at the last moment? A lot of people do. I told you, I've killed before. I can prove it. I'll take you where it happened and show you things only I can know. OK, let's do it. Penny walks straight into the police trap. And before hidden cameras, reveals more than could be imagined. She reenacts her brutal crime. It was chilling to watch the videotape of how cavalier she discussed the murder of her daughter. Hands behind her back. I had to get my knee on her just to hold down. I got my twine. Just pull it. She told the undercover operator she put the twine around her neck and strangled her daughter as she was staring her in the face. I don't really hold it down a bit. She wanted to talk about what she did. She was proud about what she did. Stronger than her in the last long. And too stupid to remain quiet about it. Okay. Penny Boudreau seals her own fate. She pleads guilty to second degree murder and is sentenced to life in prison. There were like a hundred people there. They stood outside and they jeered and they shouted and they, they shouted obscenities at her and they called her names. We've never seen that here. People were just angry. Tragic thing is a 12-year-old child who hadn't hurt anybody is no longer with us. Penny Boudreau is a monster. She is the poorest excuse of a mother I've ever seen. If I got it all worked out, you can break me out of my court hearing next year. I'll start at your hearing. You're going to do it, right? A dangerous prisoner yeah. is about to make a daring escape. 
his weapon more powerful than armed guards or handcuffs. It's the love of a woman. She did what she was told to do by the man she loved. She would have done anything for him. I think that is probably the hardest thing for me to deal with, knowing my daughter has killed somebody. In a Tennessee prison, a married mother of three begins work as a nurse. She worked shift at the prison and she was getting harassed by the other prisoners. They were showing themselves to her. So one of the guards says, well, I think we have somebody that can walk around with you and help you with these problems. Jennifer, ask thou shalt receive. I want you to meet your new bodyguard, George Hyatt. How you doing, Jennifer? George Hyatt isn't a warden. That was all mine. Thank you, warden. He's a violent, hardened criminal, serving 30 years for armed robbery and assault. He is also persuasive, according to Assistant District Attorney Frank Harvey. By all accounts that we've gotten, George Hyde can be a very charismatic, charming, likable fellow. Choosing the wrong man has been a lifelong problem for Jennifer. Jennifer has a disorder of affection. She has to be attached to some man who she thinks loves her for her to feel complete. The emotional weakness makes her easy prey for George. She was at the point in her life where she thought everything was just going downhill and he just picked her up and she was just caught up in it. She was easy, easy pickings for George Hyatt. Oh, 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 shit! You got a shrimp, girl? Yeah. Oh, Jennifer is happy to break the rules for her man. They pretty quickly developed an inappropriate, intimate relationship. And in short order, she got fired for, of all things, smuggling into him fast food. I believe it was shrimp. But Jennifer is now obsessed. She walks out on her husband and children and moves closer to the prison. He, of course, had his cell phone. And he called her, and he had her on the phone 24 hours a day. God, I wish I was there with you. I wish you were here, too. Now that he has a girlfriend on the outside, Baby, I'll love you. he won't risk losing her. Marry me? Yeah, okay. Jennifer says I do to her fourth husband in 14 years. I pretty much looked at it as Jennifer had been married a lot and she'd made another mistake. George soon makes it clear what he wants from his new wife. Babe, you gotta get me out of here. How? You can bring me out of my court hearing next year. George was facing so much time. Babe, I got it all worked out. It appears he made the decision that it was worth taking a chance. I need you to get a car, and I need you to get a gun. Can you do that for me? Okay. 
part of her really saw this as kind of a romantic adventure. Baby, I love you. With her crazy, wild criminal husband. Jennifer is about to make a life or death decision. Once a warm-hearted nurse, Jennifer Hyatt is on the run. She has been shot in the hip, helping her criminal husband escape from custody. Jennifer is the type of person that would not hurt anybody. She cared for animals. She cared for older people. She never had a mean bone in her body. So this is something that was completely out of character for Jennifer. We're free, baby. We did it. Now she has a price on her head. And it's all for love. All she wanted was a chance to be with the man she loved, and it was somehow unfair that she couldn't have that. Uh, and she decided, by golly, she was going to get it. It's August 2005. George Hyatt is on his way back to prison after a court hearing. It is here that Jennifer will prove her devotion to her husband. They had a very specific plan. She was told by George, think this over, go through this in your mind, be prepared. Oh, be prepared, be prepared. Jennifer approached the van. Just shoot him! Whoa, whoa, lady, lady, don't shoot. George said shoot, and she did. All she heard was the man she loved telling her to do something. Let's go, baby, let's go, baby! Larry Harris, the other guard, drew his weapon and returned fire. Jennifer was wounded. She had to have known it at the time, but she was able to keep going. Uh, I'm hit. Stay with it. <laughs> As Jennifer and George make their escape, Wayne Morgan lies critically injured. These guards are not strangers to us. We knew these people on a first name basis. Uh, so it was personal to all the people involved in the court system um, and, and was just a shock. It is an even greater shock for Jennifer's mother. I was watching the internet and something popped up that said there had been a shooting in Kingston, Tennessee. And I went, Oh, this is really strange. That's where Jennifer went. So I clicked on it. Well, needless to say, it pulled up her picture and said she'd shot a guard. And of course, I kind of lost it. Hiding in a motel in Kentucky, Jennifer, Jennifer hears the fateful news that will seal her future. In an exchange of gunfire. The corrections officer was shot in the abdomen and later died in hospital. Wayne Morgan, father of two, dies on the way to the hospital. He did what he was sworn to do. That was to try to keep his prisoner, and uh, he died for it. Massive hunt, a uh, lockdown of areas. Hello. It was all over the media. This is Deputy Nikki Ralston with the United States Marshal Service. After 36 hours on the run, the what couple are surrounded in Columbus, Ohio. Get George and come out of the room with your hands held up. And they knew there was no place further for them to run. So. So 
The first time I talked to her, she says she didn't regret anything. That was the day that she got incarcerated. Get your hands up. Now turn around and walk backwards towards us. She says everything was great and everything was wonderful, and she did it for the love of her life. Hands up, higher. I think that she was totally manipulated with this husband of hers. He had done this five times before, and he finally found somebody that he could manipulate to the point where she would do this for him. I do not think that Jennifer's intention was ever to shoot. Sally Lamson believes her daughter's version. She was holding the gun. And one of the guards reached for the gun, and it scared her, and she pulled the trigger. But eyewitnesses are adamant she followed George's orders. If it were otherwise, why would she have bullets in the gun? Why would she bother to know how to use the gun? If it were otherwise, why would she take the safety off the gun? She had the opportunity to back away, and she didn't. She shot instead. Jennifer Hyatt avoids the death penalty by pleading guilty to first-degree murder. She will never be released. She cries every day, every single time holidays come around. I can't believe I did this. I don't know what I was thinking. I miss my family, I miss my children. She has all the regrets in the world. She's mostly regretful for what she has done to the victim's family. Jennifer's problem was all about men. She had to have one. She wasn't exactly discriminating. She went from one to another trying to find herself. In the end, she found the one that brought her down. These deadly women put love before lives. Teenager Christine Paulilla butchered her best friends. Penny Boudreau strangled her 12-year-old daughter to keep her lover. And nurse Jennifer Hyatt gunned down a guard to free her husband. Cold, calculated murders by women desperate to please. The result of love gone wrong. <laughs>